welcome everybody again the third time we meet this week. Uh, the new faces, the old faces. I'm happy to welcome you all here for these uh, final two talks of the logic last week of this semester at our university. And thanks to these guys, some of them had already to go, but we still have uh, two very good ones left. Uh, we have Dave Gilbert and have Giorgio that are going to give uh, their two talks on global logic. And the first one will be by Dave on neighborhood semantics. Thank you very much, Dave, for joining us. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation uh, to come here. It's been a great week. It's been very, very fun. And thanks to everyone to come, for coming. Having spent some time in Natal, I, I now know for sure that you have much better things to do on a Friday afternoon and listen to logic talks. So I'm grateful that you are giving up your time to listen to this. So yeah, I will talk today about um, proof theory for neighborhood semantics. And in particular, I will try to, I will build towards introducing uh, systems of rules. So hopefully this will be new to a lot of you, even if you are familiar with the other material. Uh, okay. So my goal. I'm going to stay at a reasonably high level. I'm not going to get too uh, dirty in details. But I would like to, uh, if successful, I would like to provide a high level introduction to classical modal logics, which are kind of modal logics for which we often would use a uh, neighborhood semantics for which, uh, because these, for these logics, uh, the normal relational semantics are not adequate. So I will try to introduce these. I'm not sure how many people here are familiar with those logics. Um, I'll try to very, very briefly motivate them, but that will be my main concern. And the main point of all of this will be to build uh, to the point where I can make some comments about the proof theory for these logics in a way that might be understandable. So, my talk is three parts. Uh, in the introduction, I will just speak about modal logics generally. I apologize, I'm sure for, for many of you this is uh, very familiar material, but I wasn't sure. I didn't know how much people, how much I could assume that people knew. So it'll be very fast, but it'll just be an introduction to the bare minimum that you need for mobile logic. Then I will move to uh, these neighborhood semantics and the logics that are associated with these structures and try to explain those a little bit and give some examples. And then the main point of the talk is in the last section, which is uh, trying to understand a little bit more about the, uh, the proof theory that's appropriate for these lines. And I'd like to say at the start that all of this is joint work with my friend Paolo Fetzio, who is uh, currently in uh, Italy at the University of Turin. So, yeah. Okay, so to start, we'll just start at the very beginning, basic. Uh, propositional modal logic. Uh, so the idea is we just take normal propositional logic, with which I assume you're all familiar, um, and we add a new operator, which is this box operator. Okay? This, this is the language. So it's a normal language you're familiar with, plus, um, plus this box. And to give semantics for uh, these languages, we a very common method is to use relational semantics. So we use these relational structures, and at the highest level we have a frame. And a frame is a, is a double. So we have a set W, which is understood as a set of states, sometimes as a set of worlds, depending on the context in which uh, you're applying these logics. And we have R, which is just a binary relation on this set of states. And this is often called something like an accessibility relation, but that's, that's not so important. So this is the frame. We just have the set and a binary relation on the set. And then to make a model, we want to evaluate formulas. We need a, we need a valuation function. And this is given by this function v. And v basically just assigns to each propositional variable the set of states at which we will consider this propositional variable to be true. This is all it's doing. So we have a frame up here, and then we have a model here, which is just a frame uh, combined with the valuation function. Okay. 
And then with these definitions, we can uh, assign truth to formulas. So at the most basic, and then we do this recursively as is So we, for just the propositional variable p, we say that p will be true in a model, well, at a state w in a model m. This, this little w is a member of this big w. Okay. So p is true here, just in case um, w was one of the states that the valuation function, the valuation function assigns p to. Okay. Then the negation is intuitive, so it's the conjunction. And the box, we interpret this way. We say that uh, box phi will be true in a world and a model. Just in case uh, phi is true at all states that are accessible to the original world. And so this is where the, uh, the relation comes to. Okay. And so we can talk about a very localized notion of truth, which will be truth at a world and a model. We can generalize that a little bit to talk about a formula being globally true at a model, meaning it would be true at every world in the model. And then we can elevate that again to talk about truth or validity with respect to a frame, which would be this formula is going to be satisfied on every model based on the frame. So no matter what valuation function you attach to the frame, you're going to get phi to hold. Okay? And so we build up, um, we can build up these kind of stronger and stronger notions of truth this way. And we say eventually that a formula seems to be valid with respect to a class of frames when it is valid on every frame within that class. Um, so we have these we have these frames, and to draw pictures, we have these worlds, and then we have kind of arrows. These are the structures that we are looking at. Okay. That's the introduction to more one. Now, uh, this is uh, the next couple slides will be an attempt to maybe try to move away from this picture. This is the standard picture, and it's incredibly useful almost all the time. But the claim is that it's not always what we want. So we can consider some of these um, formulas in this language that I introduced. Um, it's very easy to verify that all of these are valid. On any, on any one of these relational pictures you can draw, all of these will be true at every state in the picture. So they are validities and so they are theorems of every system of normal model logic. Um, However, it seems like in certain contexts, these become somewhat problematic. Here's one example. Um, if we want to create some sort of logic uh, for reasoning about high probabilities, uh, we, can do, we can use a modal logic for this purpose. Okay? So we might understand the box in this context to indicate something like uh, phi carries a high probability, something like this. And uh, where we get to define our threshold. We say what our threshold is, what counts as a high probability. But then it's very easy to see that, for example, if we make uh, our threshold three, three quarters, and we take two independent events P and Q, and we assign them probability four fifths, they're each going to have high probability, but the event that constitutes both of them is not going to have high probability. Okay? So, in this context, the move from this conjunction to the box in front of the conjunction is, uh, is undesirable. This is the, the rough argument. You also have similar counterexamples in epistemic, stochastic uh, logic, uh, where we might, again, want to create a logic where, we, where the box with modality is interpreted as a, as a node, as a knowledge. Operator, so we might understand this as saying P is known by some agent, and or P is believed by some agent. And in either context, it seems dubious to allow the fact that any truth is known or believed, except by completely idealized agents. So if you want to have a more realistic 
uh, epistemic logic, you have to change things so we don't have these types of problems. Okay. Um, this was a very fast attempt to try to motivate why we might want to move away from, or why, why, why we might want to consider alternative semantic accounts of the logic. There's also just a, uh, a more inherent one, which is that they're interesting structures, so we can study them for their own sake. But if you feel like we need external motivations, maybe these will appeal to you. And then you can also find, uh, um, for example, in the talk the other day by uh, Vladimir, he talked about some of these modal logics where you interpret the box as uh, some sort of obligation. And in this case, also, you can find counterexamples to these, to these basic forms. So it seems then, also, we might have reason to abandon uh, relations. OK, so the one I'm going to talk about is I'm not going to talk about these interpretations anymore. I'm just going to focus for the rest of the talk on neighbors. OK, so the language stays the same. We're just going to have new structures over which we interpret formulas of our language. Uh, so, a frame now, we keep our set of states, our non empty set of states, but instead of having an accessibility relation, we have what's called uh, a neighborhood function. And this function goes from worlds to power set of power set of worlds. So, uh, we can think about it, we have a world here, or state. What this n gives us is a kind of assigns some set of sets where each of these are subsets of W. Okay, so this is the picture now. So we have lots of states where each of these is given some set of sets. Okay, and these are the frames. Um, and again, we, we turn a frame into a model in the same way. We just give it a valuation function, and this, fun and this works in exactly the same way as before. Okay. okay, and then for the semantics, the three um, propositional cases remain exactly the same. The only thing that changes now is uh, how we make sense of the box. And we say that box 5 holds a state and model just in case this thing here is in is one of the neighborhoods of W. And this thing is best understood as the true set of that form. Okay, so it's the set of states that satisfy 5. Okay, so for example, if this is W and one of these sets is the set of all states that satisfy 5, then a W will unbox it. This is the idea. Okay. And then we can, all the other definitions follow as we go. Okay, we have truth in state, we have truth in model, we have validity, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, I forgot to say, if you want to interrupt me at any stage, this is fine. You can ask me questions. Okay. So, when we deal with normal modal logics and uh, relational semantics, guys that look like this, we can provide nice characterization theorems that connect uh, logical systems with properties of this relation. Okay? Um, so, for example, there's a logic uh, that corresponds to all of these pictures such that every state has a reflexive error, as an error that points to itself, for example. Um, and this is nice, so we can make sense of the logical system semantically, we get more nice correspondences. The same is going to hold for our neighborhood semantics, but the properties are obviously going to be on the neighborhood function. So we're going to be able to characterize our logics based on the properties of the corresponding neighborhood functions. This is the idea. Um, So, uh, these are just some definitions. So, for example, we say that, we're going to say that our neighborhood set, uh, sorry, our neighborhood function is supplemented when, um, if we have some set here, 
And we know that we we'll call it x, and we know that x is a subset of y. Then we know that y also has to be one of these networks. So it's a closure under it's a closure under uh, supersets idea. So we will call a function like that supplemented. We can have closure under binary intersections. So for example, if we have x and we have y, we need to have the intersection of x and y. Uh, we say that it contains the units if one of these guys is in fact the set of states, and it contains the core if uh, we take this intersection of, of the sets and that's, that's it. Okay. And don't worry about the rest. So these are the kind of these are just examples of constraints we can put on the neighborhood function. So what are the corresponding syntactic things? Uh, well, these are different so-called classical model logics. So the basic classical model logic we call E usually, and it's just the smallest set of formulas that contain all propositional tautologies, closed under normal exponents, and the following: if phi and psi are provably equivalent, then box phi and box psi. That's all you have. So it's a very very weak. And this is the most basic. Uh, this is as low as we can go in a sense. Um, because as soon as you have one of these frames, here you have this. So we can't, we can't get weaker than that. Uh, and then we can have a logic M, which we just take this E, and we add to it all these instances of this axiom. And I mean, this is just a distributed, just distributivity of a box over conjunction. Then we have C, which is the other direction. And we have N, which is, so you see, uh, you've seen these all before, and these are the kind of formulas that I started with by saying. Uh, sometimes we, there will be context in which we don't want these things. So those words are chosen by N. And so we have these different uh, systems. They form a very nice picture. Um, so as I said, E is the weakest one we can get with this uh, with this semantics. And then by putting all these pieces together, we can get back K, which is the weakest um, logic we can have using this picture. Okay? So we can start much below, in a sense, and build up. Build back to where we started. Okay. And as promised, you get these uh, nice uh, characterization, characterization results. So the logic E is sound complete with respect to the class of all negative frames. If you just have M, which is the distribution of box over conjunction, then you're going to get um, sound complete results with respect to the supplemented negative frames, which are the ones closed to supersets. C corresponds to um, binary intersection. N corresponds to the functions where one of these sets is the whole, is the W. Um, R, I mean, the more R is all the quasi filters, and to get back to K, we take N to be a filter. Or we can characterize it somewhat differently as, uh, as the augmented N. And so, a natural question to ask is, um, how are these two frameworks related? And there's a nice, um, there's a nice result, which is that if we have a relational frame, we can get a neighborhood frame, and in fact, we get an augmented neighborhood frame from that. We can build it. Um, on the other hand, if we have an augmented neighborhood frame, we can get a relational frame back. Up. So the point of this is that um, this picture is really more general. Than this picture. Anything we can do here, we can do here. But there's things we, there are things we can do here that we cannot do here. This is the this is the point. Can you recall what's the augmented? Yeah, sure. Sorry, I, I, I skipped over that very fast. Um, it's supplemented and it takes out. We I, I I include this simply for. Interest really. I mean, the rest of the talk out. You don't need to remember these definitions. 
the building's definition and to remember its closure and intersections for the rest of the time. Um, so this was the background. From now on, it's more original material. Uh, so I apologize if all, everything up to now has been very, very boring. Hopefully now it will be a bit more interesting. So what's the proof theoretic project with, um, that I'm interested in? Well, it's to create well-behaved, I'll define this in a second, well-behaved sequence systems for these logics that I've introduced, for which we might use a database. This is the this is the problem. So what do I mean by well-behaved? I mean there are lots of different ways of, kind of talking about sequence systems, lots of different properties we might want them to have. Um, for this talk, I will understand well-behaved as uh, having a visibility of the usual kind of rules, the usual structural rules. We have weakening, we have contraction, we have cut. If you don't know, if you don't know what these are, it's not so important. Uh, these are common, um, desirable properties that we want to prove. That we want sequence systems to have, and they're also not what I'll be focusing. On. I'll be focusing on modularity. Um, what I mean by modularity is if you think about well, if you go back to the slide I had that showed that nice lattice of logics, you, we also, I also showed the axiom for each of, the axioms for each of these systems. You have this nice thing where you, you start at the, at the bottom at E, and you take the, the axiom for M, and you add it. Then if you want C, you just add it to that. You, know, you can take C away, you can add something new, and when you do this, your results kind of stay constant in a sense. You, oh, okay, so we have M, so now we add C, and now we can, we're going to get this correspondence to the frames where the neighborhood function is both supplemented and has the binary intersection. So it's modular in this way. You can take pieces away and put them back in as you like. Now, in proof theory and modal logic, it's well known that this is very, very difficult. I mean, even in the normal model logics, you don't have much of that, usually. I mean, it becomes a, you I mean, usually, let's just say. Uh, it becomes a huge mess. You want to come up with a system for S5, you can come up with a system for S5, but it's not some sort of, the system that you come up with isn't going to be the system for K plus the system for um, T plus some other system. You, you don't build it in this way. Kind of, you look at S5, you build the right system. You look at S4, you build the right system. And uh, this is annoying. Um, and so, the first thing that Paolo and I wanted to do was to see if we could come up with a sequence system for these classical logics that actually have all of these one way of getting modularity is by introducing labels and relation models. This is the rules. Okay. So that's a perfect. Uh, no, it's not perfect. You were one slide too early. <laughs> I think it's the next slide. This would have been perfect. I just want to mention that uh, we aren't the first people to study um, proof theory for classical model logic. You have some very nice work uh, by Hansen, who introduced very nice tableau systems for specifically for monotonic, uh, for the for the ones with M, that have M as an axiom. She has very, very nice work, also here. Um, and there's also been sequence systems, in particular, uh, this paper is a very, very nice paper. Very elegant system, really beautiful, but it doesn't have much of it. Uh, they have very nice uh, results, very nice systems, but it lacks so much of it. So, how do you get the modularity? And this is the point. We need a starting point. And so, as I said, even in um, even in normal order logics, taking this modularity is very difficult. And usually, the best way to do it is to cheat a little bit, in some sense, uh, by uh, by importing some semantic information into your into your proof. Theory. And uh, so we will, for the purpose of this talk, I mean, there are some other ideas, but. For this talk, I just want to talk about labeled, um, labeled sequences. And yeah, in particular, we're going to build on ideas 
by Dubai and also by uh, Serenegri and whatnot. They've really developed these systems a lot. They have very nice results. They're, these, these for normal model logics are very well understood. So we're kind of taking their system and we're going to try to mess with it to try to get it to work for classical model logics. So what's happening here? What's happening is that uh, this gamma and this delta is a multiset, so we have a lot of repetition in there. Um, but now, instead of just uh, being multisets of formulas, they're multisets of these kind of formula world pairs. So the idea is we don't just have a proposition here inside, we have a proposition along with a label. And this label should be very clear, this is meant to correspond to the state at which P is set to be true. Okay, this is um, and all of the normal uh, propositional rules should be familiar to you. I mean, they're the normal sequence rules. The difference is um, when you go to the modal rule, because now we have an additional piece of information. We have not only these label formulas, but we have purely semantic. Um, I don't know. These pieces of purely semantic information. I mean, this is this is saying x is accessible to w, and uh, yeah. I mean, it, it, the, the meaning is very clear. If cross by holds at w and x accessible to W, then you need 5 to hold the X. Okay. So, this is, the, this is the starting point of these systems. Uh, so what's nice about this? What's nice is um, you get all of the nice proof theory here. You get your cut admissibility, you get um, height preserving, uh, weakening and contraction admissibility, all of these things that you should like. And in particular, for our purposes and for the purposes of this talk, it's modular. So if you want to, so I showed you the system for K on the previous slide, which is just the, the system for the, all of these guys, no, with no restraints on the, on the accessibility relation. But if you want to, for example, obtain the logic T, which is what you get when you restrict your semantic attention to only those frames that are reflexive, that have all reflexive errors, then you can take the system for K that you built and just add this rule, which tells you which forces uh, reflexivity in every state. Okay? And so you obtain modularity. So this is the advantage of using this as a style. It should be obvious that this is Okay, but the problem. And the work that has to be done is to figure out how to use this framework um, for neighborhood semantics, if, which are arguably more complex. Um, I mean, here we're just dealing with binary relations that are usually kind of, um, they're easy to work with. We're, we're used to working with them. They're familiar. Uh, reflexivity is a very easy thing to, to represent for all x, x r x, yeah? Uh, symmetry, if x are y, y are x, transitivity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are very easy things to characterize in a very basic first order language. These neighborhood semantics, we are dealing with with I mean, dealing with functions, we're dealing with these truth set things. Uh, it's not as obvious to see how to um, how to proceed. So one, again, this is one solution, and Paolo and I have some other ideas as well, but for the purpose of this talk, this is, this, this is what I want to talk about, which we will utilize a translation from the, the logic, the language that I've already introduced, which just has one box. And I'm actually going to translate all of these formulas into uh, a modal language that has five modal operators. This is, I'll, we can get into the details of why we need this but um, this is the plan. And this is inspired by results from Kraft and Volter, and also, as far as I know, 
these papers are kind of um, simultaneous, and I don't think either cites the other. I think they're about the same time and have similar results, although this one is uh, much, much more detailed. So what's the intuition, the starting point? If you just think about what it means to say that box phi is true at a world at state in one of these frames, you just say it in English, it, you say, okay, it's true at a world W if and only if there is some set uh, in and the W uh, that is the truth set of phi. This is, this is the English translation of what this is. Uh, and we kind of start, we can kind of start to unpack this logically, and we see that this is obviously so. Box in this context is an existential notion. Box in this context is a universal notion. You say that box phi is true in this world, when in all the worlds we can see, we have phi. Here it's an existential notion. If, there, if one of these guys that is in the set is the right one, and this notion of being the right one, we are going to have some universal notions. Okay? So, in a sense, what I'm trying to motivate is the idea of we have three quantifiers uh, in the sentence like this. Okay? And quantifiers, I mean, there's a well-known correspondence between quantifiers in a first-order language and, and modalities. I mean, this guy kind of corresponds to a universal, and it's dual, the diamond corresponds to the next time. Uh, okay, so what you get if you push this further, we're going to, our language L5 is going to contain three um, unary modalities. Okay? Don't worry about the nullary modalities. Uh, these we, I will get to later. Um, and the, so we have the usual proposition of that, the usual proposition of connected abbreviation. So basically, Ignore, nothing happens if you're just talking about propositional variables or basic um, conjunctions or, or negations. The translation does nothing. The translation only does something when we encounter a box formula. Then what does it do? Okay, it says that phi is true at a state if there exists some set that's um, inaccessible in a sense such that the state has the property that everything in this set is a phi state and everything not in this set is a not phi state. I mean, this is meant to unpack the notion of being a truth set and this is meant to represent that it's one of the sets we have in our, in our set that is accessible. Um, and I've obviously named them in very suggestive ways. The diamond corresponds to the neighborhood function. This corresponds to set membership. This corresponds to not to be. Okay? This, there's no tricks. This is what, this is what you think it is. Um, we can also define a very ugly uh, semantic uh, correspondence. So we take one of these frames and we can define a relational frame out of this frame. It doesn't only have one relation, now it's three relations, but we do it in this way. We take our, so, we're trying to get a relational frame, so we need a, st a set of states and some relations, some binary relations on this, on this state, on the set, sorry. So what is our set going to be? Well, it's the set of all the states uh, combined with the set of all subsets, all of the potential guys that can live in the big circle. For this talk, this is the definition I'll use. You can also use this definition, um, which you'll see, I mean, basically what this definition says is you take only the subsets that you actually use. Um, whereas here we're going to take all the subsets. There are trade-offs. Uh, this makes a nice proof theory. This um, makes it possible to prove uh, certain completeness results that you can't prove if you have uh, this definition. So for this talk, I'm not going to go into the kind of completeness results we can prove 
for these systems that I'll show you. So we'll just use the, the easy one. So our domain is the set of all the states, and at the same time, in the same domain, the set of all the subsets. Now, the, the first relation is the relation that's meant to correspond to some state here. It's one of these neighborhoods here. Okay, so it's going to be W is related to this X. Okay? And when is W related to the X? Well, it's going to be related when this X is one of the neighborhoods of W. And this is what um, this definition says. So the guys that are R and related, we always, I mean, again, I've chosen very suggestive names for the variables. This is to try to make it clear what's happening. Okay, so think about the W's as sets and the A, sorry, as states and the A's as sets. Um, and so we're going to say that W and A are related by R sub N when A was one of the neighborhoods. And uh, the membership and the not membership work exactly as you, as you want. Notice though that the type is switched. Um, and then we use the nullary modalities simply as kind of a way to cheat and to type what's happening. So we take sigma to just be all of the states. And we take uh, tau to be all of the sets. So we can tell them all. So why, why didn't they appear in the translation? Because they're not needed in the translation. And you can do a lot without them. They're, they simply make things easier. And for example, we have a theorem here that says if you take a if you take a neighborhood model, the phi phi is going to be satisfied in this uh, in this neighborhood model if and only if in this big monster we build it's satisfied at the same W. Okay, but notice. This correspondence takes place at the level, at a local level. If you want to lift that, you use the, you use the same. This is the point of the same. It's like, like in algebra, if you use the top yeah. to express the identity. So if we use the sigma, we can get actually model correspondence results. And the tau is to make, to improve theory tricks. I'm not tricks, but to make things work. More easily, and you also need it in the complete in the types of complete theorems that I will be proving today, but they're necessary. And so, what is the ugly system that you get? Uh, you get this. If you, I've left out the, um, I've left out the conjunction and negation. You've already seen those rules. Those rules are unchanged. These are just all of the modal rules that you have. So. You have, and I mean, notice that it's really just one rule repeated three times because we have three different modalities. They all behave exactly the same. They're all normal in the sense of being over here. Um, and so this and this are the exact same rule. They just correspond to different modalities. They just have three modalities. And um, these rules, these are kind of initial sequence that uh, function in the same way that P implies P. If, if, if A is a tau, then A needs to be a tau. Okay, and you take this, um, yeah, and you can, this is this system. So you take all the propositional rules, you take these rules, you throw them together, and you also need to add these rules, which are, these are the purely semantic rules, to make sure that the labels basically behave properly. So you can't have something being both a state and being, both, and being a set. We, we make this restriction. Um, you can't have a state belonging to one of the sets and not belonging to one of the sets, uh, et cetera. You, we need these for uh, basic, basic methods. But if you do nothing and you just add these, uh, you just come up with these rules, so you have a, it's just a multimodal logic, with no work 
you get this result for completely free. There's no work done to get this. This is all the work of Negri and Lumber. This is them. Uh, you get that we have weakening, um, all the rules are vertical, we have contraction, and we have cut. This is for free, we're not doing anything. Except for um, having to deal with this pain in the ass translation. We have to do that, and we get this. Uh, it doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense. Um, this is slightly more interesting. We also get this theorem. Uh, which is basically a kind of a completeness and soundness theorem all wrapped into one. So if we have a provable sequence in our system that I just showed you, uh, the sequence is valid with uh, this, this notion of validity corresponds to those big relational frames with, uh, with the three, um, three binary relations, which is the same thing as being um, valid Normally, on the neighborhood frame, which is the same thing as being provable in the basic, um, in the basic system. So this is nice. I mean, it's a it's a starting point. Is the, is the issue. Um, sorry. And then the question then is how to extend this? Because okay, so now I have a system for E. As you saw at the beginning, E is a complete. It's a very very weak system. All you get is that two, if two things are provably equivalent, then their boxes are provably equivalent. This doesn't get you very far. In almost any context, you're going to want a lot more power than this. So how do we extend it? In other words, what are the rules that we need to come up with that correspond to uh, the constraints we place on the neighborhood functions? I mean, I gave you one example earlier of how you might extend the, the system for K to have T. You need to add a rule that corresponds to reflexivity. Here we need to add rules that correspond to the functions on the, the sorry, the constraints on the function. Okay, so okay, so this is the point. How do we do this? Um, again, Negri and Plato have made clear how to create these cut-free sequence calculi for what are somewhere called geometric theories. Um, by giving a method, like a, an algorithm, for taking these axioms and turning them into rules. You don't have to think, you just do. So, as an example, here we have an example of one of these geometric axioms. Uh, so each P is an atomic formula, and then these M's are conjunctions of atomic formula. And if you have a geometric axiom like this, you get a sequence rule like this. Um, where these dots here indicate um, there's a space. So you have a, you have a sequence here. And then you have, it's like it's a branching. It's a branching rule, so you'll have some guy here, here, so and so. Okay, so it's a branching. That's what these dots are. Um, yeah, so if you have a geometric axiom, you get it for free. And you don't have to worry about the formal way of writing. Okay, so now can we use this to come up with rules for our system? The answer is it doesn't seem it doesn't seem like it. because if you just consider C, so this is the axis that corresponds to a closure under under binary intersection. So we have if x is one of the neighborhoods and y is one of the neighborhoods, then their intersection has to be one of the neighborhoods. This is the semantic condition. So again, you look just you have to forgive some of the uses of notation because it's just easier. It talks like this, but this corresponds to this first order formulation. Okay, if A is one of the neighborhoods of W, B is one of the neighborhoods of W, um, and this C is the intersection of A and B, then C needs to be. Uh, okay. 
problem is you can look at this very quickly and see that it's not a geometric form. So it doesn't seem like the algorithm gets us what we want. Um, but there's um, very new work about generalized geometric forms. Um, so things are going to get more um, cumbersome from a notational perspective. But the idea here is before we said, okay, we take our P's to just be atomic formulas and we take our M's to be conjunctions of atomic formulas. Now what we do is build a hierarchy of these geometric formulas and at each subsequent level of the hierarchy, we allow these M's to not only be conjunctions of atomic formulas, but to be conjunctions of geometric formulas at the lower level. So we build in this sense. Okay? Um, so again, at the base level, GF0, these are the geometric formulas. Sorry, uh, could, could you just tell me what, uh, what is this reference you have to nine? Yes, this is, uh, I don't know if it's been published yet. It's, um, it's a paper by Sarah Negri. Uh, in which she first talks about generalizing these geometric yeah, formulas. Yeah, I think it's in her, her book as well, um, at least the beginning of it. The, ge the geometric formulas are in her book? Yeah, yes, yes. Well, I, 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 I think that this one's on her book. I could, maybe, you're, maybe you're right. Uh, as far as I know, the first one is this paper that's forthcoming in logical conversation. Okay. But, 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 and the second book, I think. You might be, you might be right. But this, this citation is the paper, oh. so, yeah. <laughs> uh, where she really tries to give some uh, more general results you know, about, about these types of rules. <laughs> okay, uh, so this is the idea. You just allow these atoms to increase in complexity. You can ignore this slide if you want. This is me trying to articulate in English the intuition of how to turn this into rules. Uh, it doesn't make sense to me sometimes, sometimes it does. But the idea is if you have this, um, we kind of have an intuition about how these geometric guys work. And now in each step, we, we kind of have to unpack the level of geometric formulas. So we can expect kind of in each of these steps, we have the same rule again embedded in, in the sequence. Does that kind of make sense? In the same way that in the syntactically in the formulas, we've got embeddings of geometric formula, generalized geometric formulas within generalized geometric formulas, we're going to have sequent rules in sequent rules, is the idea. Uh, this I don't know. Or hypersequence. Yeah, this hypersequence question is um, is an interesting one, but I, I don't know the answer. And the first the first one I don't. Are you going to show how to unpack the rule you have shown before? Yes. Okay. Eventually. <laughs> it's not very pretty when you when you get there, but so we have so now we uh, oh, this is an example, sorry. So this is a generic, um, generalized geometric formula of level one. So it's not the geometric formula, it's the level above. So what you get, this is what I was trying to explain very badly before, is this is what the first rule looks like. But then, each of these rules, you have another, you have another step, which corresponds kind of intuitively to the step of well then unpacking the lower level geometric formula, generalized geometric formula of level GF0 that sits inside this one on GF1. And so you get some a picture that looks like this with the constraint that, so not only might you have uh, variable constraints that you normally would have, but you have an order constraint, which is that this, for example, this guy has to appear above this guy. Within a, within a proof. You can't just apply it anywhere. I mean, you first have to have this instance of R1 upon which you can base this instance of R2. 
Okay? And it has to be above this C, but not this one. Because above this one is R3. And these, these dots are meant to represent that you can do anything you want in between. It doesn't, this isn't an immediate consequence. It doesn't have to follow immediately. You can do a lot of stuff, but at some stage, if you want to apply this, it has to be above here. This is the idea. And so, now here's the answer to your question. Uh, we take our condition that we wrote, we mess with it a little bit, and we get this, which is a generalized geometric formula of level one. And it turns into this system. With, with, um, with both a variable condition, that C did not occur in gamma or delta, as well as a, uh, an order condition on these two modes. Um, and notice this one's a bit simpler because you actually we don't have to worry about multiple sequences on this line. It's just it's branching. So this guy has to appear above this, and this guy has to appear above this. But there's no order imposed between these two. Okay. And then you can prove the following proof theoretic result. Um, and you get the same corresponding uh, uh, complete and soundness kind of result as well. And, and the thing is, we can actually find systems of rules for all of the all of the axioms I gave earlier. You, they all turn out to be generalized geometric forms. They all turn out to correspond to generalized geometric forms. So we can provide rules for all of them, and we can combine them in exactly the way we want to combine them. So there are, uh, so we have one for m, one for c, one for n. And we can uh, plug them in and pull them out as we want to. And uh, so we obtain our goal, in a sense. The negative aspects are obvious, I think. Uh, it's a very elegant system. I mean, it's elegant from a meta theoretical sense in that we have very nice completeness and soundness results. We have nice. Uh, we have cut and visibility, et cetera, et cetera. So it's nice in that sense, but. You, I mean, it doesn't look very pretty, these rules, especially when you combine all of them together. It's not a very nice looking system. And uh, maybe also the usual concerns that um, are often raised about these types of projects, which is that you're incorporating a hell of a lot of uh, semantic information into your proof. And this is, uh, there are lots of fights about this. But, whether this is acceptable, um, how acceptable it is. And this motivates, I told you, I mean, I, as I said at the beginning, this is an ongoing project, and these concerns motivate some current work that we have, but uh, this is much more in its infancy. It's not really anything like that. Okay, that's it. Uh, this is the this is this was the citation. That's all I have.